On the 21st of August, 1911, Leonardo's Mona Lisa, the world's most famous artwork, was stolen from the Louvre Museum. The thief was Vincenzo Perugia, an Italian handyman and amateur painter. But police would not learn this for years. For lack of leads, they followed anything that seemed promising. Then someone with a known connection to the Polish-born poet Guillaume Apollinaire and his best friend, Spanish-born painter Pablo Picasso, wrote in to a Parisian newspaper. He complained that he had planned to steal Mona Lisa, and whoever had taken the painting had messed up his system, by which he had been regularly stealing from the Louvre. Police leapt at the chance. They brought in first Apollinaire and then Picasso for questioning. The two were entirely innocent of the Mona Lisa theft, but were terrified because they were guilty of having been involved in stealing other things from the Louvre. The so-called Affaire des Statuettes is surprisingly little known, despite having been confirmed on all sides, including in the memoir of Picasso's lover at the time, Fernand Olivier, and by Picasso himself. I'm a professor specializing in the history of art crime, and the general rule is that criminal collectors of art do not exist outside the realm of film and fiction. Collectors who commission the theft of artworks they desire can be counted in the low dozens, a minuscule number when we consider that tens of thousands of artworks are reported stolen each year, as many as 20,000 a year in Italy alone. But Picasso was among them. My research into the Affaire des Statuettes makes clear that Picasso was knowingly involved in stealing several ancient Iberian statue heads from the Louvre Museum probably not only commissioning the theft, but also participating in it. And the theft proved integral to the creation of Picasso's first masterpiece, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, often called the first modernist artwork. The main thief and the man who wrote to a Parisian newspaper complaining about the Mona Lisa having disrupted his own burgling was a Belgian con man, secretary, soldier, and later cowboy by the name of Joseph Honoré Géry Pierret. He had been working circa 1907 as a personal secretary for Apollinaire, then a renowned journalist, modern art critic, and poet. Géry Pierret was also a compulsive art thief. He stole from the Louvre so often that he once asked his girlfriend, Marie Laurencin, Marie, I'm off to the Louvre this afternoon. Can I bring you anything you need? She thought he meant something from the shopping arcade adjacent to the Louvre when he meant the museum itself. By his own admission, Géry Pierret began stealing from the Louvre in March 1907, though evidence suggests that he began sometime earlier. An Iberian statue head was stolen in November 1906, and the theft was featured in the newspaper Le Matin. That article mentions how the low financial value of the Iberian statue head in general, stating that the thief might be, quote, a possessive and discreet collector who has no interest in money, but keeps the statues in the most secret part of his apartment, getting drunk on their beauty in solitude. That a criminal collector must be behind art thefts is a suggestion that the media regularly touted, though there are very few known historical instances of this being the case. This would prove to be one of those very few exceptions. In his letter sent after the Mona Lisa had been stolen and had captured the headlines, Géry Pierret boasted of having smuggled the statue heads out of the museum under his coat, stopping en route to ask a museum guard for directions to the nearest exit. He was clearly interested in touting his accomplishments, perhaps with unrealistic grace notes embellishing the true story. In agreement with an article in Paris Journal, the thief Géry Pierret committed to writing his story, which they published in the same 29th of August edition of their newspaper. The flush of press brought on by the Mona Lisa theft, and now by the uproar caused by the publication of Géry Pierret's letters, frightened Picasso and Apollinaire. Géry Pierret's version of the story saw him as the sole thief. But the work of a modern scholar, Silvia Loretti, found that there were holes in it. The statue heads were too cumbersome for one person to easily carry, much less under their coat. And the heads, which had been on display when Picasso first saw them and fell in love with them, 
seeing in them an ancient predecessor to his own contemporary Iberian art aesthetic, were by 1907 in storage. That means this could not have been a crime of opportunity, but had to be well planned with a thief or more likely thieves descending into the Louvre storage to fish out exactly the statuettes they were after. One of the statue heads, which had been stolen in 1911 and was returned along with the first letter by Géry Pierret, had been stashed in Apollinaire's apartment. But the other two statues, those returned by Apollinaire, had been in Picasso's possession since their theft in 1907. We know that Picasso kept them hidden among his clothes because his lover at the time, Fernand Olivier, had noted in her memoir how she always found it odd that of all the artworks in Picasso's collection, most of which were displayed prominently around his apartment and studio, only these two statue heads remained resident at the bottom of his wardrobe. She wrote that Picasso, quote, took great care of his 1907 gifts and kept them buried in a wardrobe. Fernand Olivier wrote of the affair in her memoir, quote, Géry Pierre gave Picasso two little statuettes without revealing where he had acquired them. He said only that they should not be displayed in too conspicuous a manner. Picasso was enchanted and he treasured these gifts and buried them at the back of a cupboard. Her memoir continues explaining how worried Apollinaire and Picasso were, making plans to flee the country after the Mona Lisa theft. They thought to dispose of the evidence and put the heads in a suitcase, intent on throwing it into the Seine River, but came home with the suitcase still in hand. The pressure was so great that Apollinaire made the dangerous and perhaps foolish decision to personally return the two statue heads that had been stolen in 1907. He left them at the Paris Journal office on the 5th of September, 1911. The next day, the newspaper published an article about their return, featuring photographs of the statuettes, along with the excuse provided by the unnamed owner, quote, one would not think that such unrefined objects could have been part of the Louvre collection. Seduced by the relatively low price, he purchased them. Seeing their photographs in the paper, Louvre curator Edmond Potier recognized the two statue heads as entries AM1140, and AM1141 in the inventory of Mediterranean antiquities kept by the museum. Potier immediately contacted the newspaper and was told that the statues had been brought in by, quote, an honorable individual who had purchased the two heads for a small amount of money and who had grown concerned after the rumors in the press about the thefts of the Iberian statuettes. And thinking that he might, without realizing it, have purchased stolen objects, he brought them into the newspaper. On September 7th, Apollinaire was arrested under several accusations, half of them true. He was accused of harboring the thief of the Iberian statue heads, of which he was guilty. But the Paris police, grasping for a positive headline to offset the lack of progress on the Mona Lisa case, threw in another charge that was based on no apparent evidence, that Apollinaire was also involved in the theft of the Mona Lisa. The police needed a scapegoat, and Apollinaire was an ideal choice in that he appealed to the xenophobia of the French at the time. He was born in 1880 in Rome as Wilhelm Albert Rodzimierz Apollinari Kostrawicki, his mother a member of the minor nobility of Poland. His father was most likely Francesco Fluggi d'Aspermont, a Swiss-Italian aristocrat who left soon after, soon after Apollinaire's birth. Apollinaire grew up speaking French, was educated in Monaco, and lived most of his life in Paris, in love with France and the French language, and later considered to be one of the greatest Francophone poets. But he was technically a foreigner, and in a country where the madness of the Dreyfus affair was a fresh memory, he was an ideal scapegoat. Right-wing publications attacked him. His biggest crime from their perspective was not having been born French. In police custody, Apollinaire vehemently denied involvement in the thefts of either the statue heads or the Mona Lisa. He did, however, admit that he knew the man who had stolen the statue heads. He had housed Joseph Honoré Géry Pierre during the thefts, employing him as a personal secretary, but dismissing him from service soon after the thefts took place. This was how the police first became aware of the name Géry Pierre was quickly recognized as the author of the pseudonymous letters to Paris Journal 
complaining that someone else had stolen Mona Lisa so that he could not. Apollinaire was compelled to reveal the link to Picasso in the Louvre theft, which led to Picasso being questioned. The two were interrogated separately and neither represented himself with Ong. Picasso was so frightened, particularly of being deported back to Spain, that he denied having ever seen Apollinaire, at that time his closest friend. Picasso and Apollinaire were both released. Picasso wound up painting some of the statue heads over the faces of the prostitutes in his Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Géry Pierret was arrested in Cairo in late 1913 on suspicion of involvement with the Mona Lisa theft, but the courts there acquitted him. I was glad of this, Apollinaire wrote. The poor fellow was crazy rather than criminal. The courts must have thought so too. Jerry Pierre made his way to the United States, where he was last heard of working as a cowboy near San Diego. After Apollinaire was cleared of involvement in the Mona Lisa theft, the air cleared and both he and Picasso were left with still greater celebrity, albeit for the dubious achievement of having been wrongfully accused of the most famous art theft in history, while at the same time being guilty of an only slightly, slightly less objectionable series of thefts from the same museum. There is a sad coda to Apollinaire's involvement in the Affaire des Statuettes, first noted by Peter Reed in his book on the friendship of the Polish poet and Picasso. The affair may have actually led, albeit indirectly, to Apollinaire's tragic premature death. Apollinaire loved France and was devastated by the xenophobic accusations and attacks against him in 1911. Three years later, fate would present him with an opportunity to prove his loyalty to his adopted country. At the start of the First World War, Apollinaire volunteered for the French army. He died from influenza while hospitalized for a head wound received in action. He was part of the one third of Europe who lost their lives before the war wound to a close. The Iberian statuettes are now back at the Louvre, although not always on display. They played a key role in the history of art thanks to their cameo in the birth of modernism in Picasso's 1907 Les Demoiselles d'Avignon and they will be forever remembered for the supporting role they played in the story of the theft of Mona Lisa. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. This is a very brief version, of course, the 10 minute version of lectures that I normally give um, up to 90 minutes long, and it features a chapter in one of my books called The Thefts of the Mona Lisa. Um, but what I think is interesting from the history of art crime perspective is how this is probably the most famous example of the exception to the rule. In general, the idea that thieves will commission, or rather collectors will commission thieves to steal famous works of art, or the idea that thieves will target known artworks and keep them for themselves rather than trying to sell them is largely the work of fiction and film. There are very few examples we know of historically this romantic approach that was promoted by the media, but this is one of the few exceptions to the rule. So in this case, we have a real theft, um, almost certainly commissioned by Picasso and likely involving him of these Iberian statue heads from the Louvre, their involvement in the birth of artistic modernism through being featured in Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, and also this funny coda to the most famous theft of any object in history, which is almost certainly the theft of the Mona Lisa. So thank you very much for your time and for inviting me to participate in this great conference.